because did you do the background check thing? I'll probably do that. Yeah, I just think there's a time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, my name's uh, Chris McCann. Hi. Uh, I started the company Startup Digest. Um, how we originally founded the company was uh, I moved to Palo Alto here uh, to Silicon Valley in June 2009. Uh, literally just threw all my stuff in my car, drove up here, no plan, no idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, just literally came up here um, with no intention of, uh, yeah, didn't know anybody. Um, and I, I just, I started going to a whole bunch of events, uh, mainly just because since I was new to the area and, and also because I wanted to get more connected to the startup world. So I started going to hackathons and meetup groups and user groups and that sort of stuff. And then I just sort of started picking the best ones for myself. Because I noticed as an outsider, it was really hard for me to know what was good and what wasn't. So I started picking the good things, screening out the rest. And then some of my friends were like, hey, this is kind of interesting. Can you send me those too? And so in November 2009, we sent our first newsletter out, originally just to 20 people. And that's how Startup I just got started. And then from November till December, um, it was originally just here. And then one of my good friends, Carter Cleveland, uh, moved to New York City and he was like, hey, I want to do Startup Digest, but for New York City. Uh, and this is when we sort of came up with now what we call the curator model, where we have a uh, founder, hacker, investor living in the city that they're in. They're the ones that pick the best events and we do all the publishing. So now Startup Digest is in 99 cities all around the world. We have about 230,000 email subscribers. That's spread across 43 different countries, so much bigger. Um, originally, how the investors sort of came along is when we were doing it, when we were in Silicon Valley, New York City, about five or 6,000 subscribers, uh, another friend of mine wanted to advertise his conference in Startup Digest. So at the time, we were like, oh my god, somebody wants to pay us like to be in an email? That's crazy. Uh, and then we ran his advertisement. We sold, I think, eight tickets during that first advertising. And that's when we realized like we might have something here because like not only are people subscribing to it, but it's a valuable audience that people want to reach and people are willing to pay us for it. Okay, but um, in the end, it's not about advertising. It's about the VIPs, or? Yeah, um, so we originally went with the sponsorship business model, if you will, for probably about a year, a year and a half. And we sort of realized, like, while it worked, there was a different like, cap on it. Um, so we sort of rethought things and thought, you know, hey, if we can do anything, like, what would we want to try within this? So at the time, we got money from the Kauffman Foundation. So the Kauffman Foundation is a big foundation for entrepreneurship all around the world. They gave us a grant to be uh, basically the exclusive sponsor in all of the Startup Digest all around the world. And that gave us sort of the freedom and capital and money to sort of experiment with things. Uh, and that's how, we, uh, that's how we fill in out what we call the Startup Digest VIP product. Um, it's a recruiting product for, on one side it's engineers, designers, and product managers. On the other side it's companies who are looking to hire. And essentially it's sort of like a dating site for both sides to meet. And then anybody who gets placed through the system itself, we get paid like a recruiter in the middle, uh, taking a percentage of recruiting fees of the person. So, um, so people who are coming to the uh, Silicon Valley are already VIPs in some way. Yeah. So you're just picking the VIPs of these VIPs? Sort of, it's sort of the same thing with, with Startup Digest. So my problem was there's so many events out there, it's hard for me to know what was good and what wasn't. So I started picking the best stuff for myself. Uh, the same thing with talent, like there's so many people out there looking to join companies, it's really hard to know if this is your first time hiring, who's good and who's not. So essentially what we're trying to do is screen out the good people within this, so we're trying to find the good engineers, designers, product managers, people who have like built things before, designed things before, tried side projects, maybe tried their own company, maybe worked at a startup before, has shown some level of, uh, um, uh, of just sort of getting out there and getting their hands dirty. And those are the people we pick from the, the, the larger pool of people, and that's who we connect the companies with. So yes, on one hand, we are sort of screening out the, 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 the tip of the tip, if you will, but that's sort of our, our audience for Startup Digest VIP. And how many people apply to become a VIP? Yeah, um, I think since we've started it, we've probably had eight or 9,000 people apply. Um, from that, I think, I believe we picked a, a little bit around 500 VIPs, and we've picked about 120 companies. So we're pretty selective on both sides. And, and like I said, we're trying to sort of screen out the, uh, the, the, the good people, if you will, from, from the rest and trying to highlight them. 
Do you think you would be one of the <laughs> elected VIPs at the beginning? Probably not when I first moved here. <laughs> when I first moved here, I was literally super naive. I had no idea what I was doing. I was a business guy. I couldn't code. I couldn't do anything. I was doing side projects looking for a technical co-founder. I was that guy. <laughs> uh, so I guess like, you know, um, as time progressed, I've sort of learned like, you know, I've learned code, I've learned design, I've learned this other stuff, and I've tried to like, you know, just improve my own personal skills just because I like doing this stuff. Uh, but when I first moved here, I probably would not accept myself, which is kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> Are people getting angry if they don't uh, become a VIP? Yeah, um, we don't really have people who are angry. We actually don't. Um, so we just tell the people who have been accepted. We don't tell the other side. We have people who are just curious, like, hey, like, am I actually going to be one? What's the process? Like? So we've never had anybody like pissed off or anything. They haven't been a part of it. Um, just like I said, like what we're trying to do is sort of pick the like get a good indication and get a good screen on who is good. So if you're not picked, we're not saying you're not good. We're just saying it was sort of hard for us to make a decision. So maybe you need to like you know we always suggest like you know if you didn't get in like you know work on some more side projects like throw some things out there like go to hackathons, go to a startup weekend, like try stuff, build stuff. The more you can point to and say, hey, I made this. It didn't work. It didn't get traction, but I made this thing. Check it out. Um, that's the that's the number one way to get noticed here by us or by anybody else. So it's about making mistakes. Yes, <laughs> um, building things, making mistakes, trying it, being active. Um, the the the. The, the people where it's hard to tell, it's like, you know, hey, if you work at a bigger company and you're like interested in startups, but you really haven't really like tried something before, it's a lot harder to tell, like, are you serious about it? Like, if you find a good company, are you really going to join them? Are you really going to be active and sort of be like a, a self-directed and all that stuff? It's much easier if you say, I made these things, I made these things, look at me, like I've actually done it. Um, then it's much easier signal for us and for anybody else. And there's a lot of need to find uh, good people here in this area. Yeah, I mean, all the companies in the valley are hiring like crazy. I mean, uh, it, it's so easy to get funding. So you have a lot of companies who have raised X number of millions of dollars. And um, hiring is usually the number one problem after you um, after you raise money. And you could just see like uh, on, in Silicon Valley, there's a freeway called the 101. And when you're driving through it, you can see all the billboards. Of, companies are literally buying billboards, announcing that they're hiring and spending. I don't even know how much money a month literally to just have a billboard like the the pain is really high to find good people so on the company side it's hugely demanding so um, is it easier to find good people in other cities or is it even harder um i don't know that's a good question um it's easier in the sense that there's less good companies recruiting so in silicon valley there's just so many companies um it's 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 hard to get talent in general if you're in some place like you know Tokyo or Kansas City or Cape Town, South Africa, there's probably not as many companies. But on the other end, there's probably not as much supply. In Silicon Valley, a lot of people come here from all around the world to work on startups. Engineers, designers, all over. Literally, this is the place to go. So, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier in other cities, but there's probably less competitive pressure, especially on the company side. But there's definitely the less supply on the other side as well. Uh, which positions are the gold nuggets in this gold rush? Oh, <laughs> like what are the valuable positions? It's the three we do. It's the engineers, designers, and product managers. Um, we actually experiment in doing some with like sales or some with like biz dev or even actually having like other recruiters in there like for companies to hire recruiters. Um, the only thing is with any of these, like the supply is sort of there already. So if a company is looking to hire a sales people, a sales person, it's really easy to put it out out there and get a ton of sales people apply and sort of pick and choose from your own. The, the problem is on the other side, if you put out a, an engineering job post, you tend to not get a lot of responses. So still still valuable on the other side, just there's more supply and demand. Um, but the engineers, designers, and product managers are definitely the most valuable people here. And if I'm a tourist at the moment, how, um, how would I try to find a job here? Or is this possible? I'd say like, you know, the easiest way by far is like, you know, if you're visiting here for the first time, like, you know, just go pick out a couple, like a list of companies that you think would be interesting and just like send them an email, like try and visit them, try and see what events they're going to, try and meet whoever's speaking there, like representing them at the thing. Um, the, the number one thing is to figure out like what you're interested in, what you like. And then after you find that, it, it's pretty easy to meet people and meet companies around here. You started the Society of Knowledge. What is the Society of Knowledge? <laughs> Yeah, um, when I was doing, while I was doing Startup Digest, like I almost came right out of college and I started this company. 
And when you're starting a company, you tend to be very focused on what you're doing. And you spend, tend to spend a lot of time with your team and your product and that sort of stuff. And one of the things I really missed is in college, you got to have all these like, me and my roommates in college, we'd have just like, all these like, random discussions about like philosophy and psychology and politics and religion just about like weird stuff that like you know about history or you know things that might not even matter at that point in time but you know we just like to talk to talk through about and now one thing uh, I sort of miss doing a company is I miss those sort of random intellectual discussions that I sort of had so I started this uh, thing called the society of knowledge super small thing total side project just wanted to like mainly for myself sort of you know get it out there and stuff or we do these like small little um, sort of things over beers, small little gathering over beers. And we just talk about, we have a topic and we just talk about weird abstract things that might not even apply. Because you know, I think it's important to sort of think outside of what you're doing, um, think historically and sort of think bigger picture, think more abstractly. Um, so this was something I started just because I was more interested in it. And it, it's just a small little fun gathering of a party now. <laughs> yeah. And are you still uh, reading paper books? Yes, <laughs> uh, I love books. Uh, I try and read as much as I can uh, when I'm not doing the company. Um, and yeah, I like I like physical books. Um, I try to Kindle, I try all these other things, but nothing really beats like a physical book. <laughs> There's just a different feeling when you have something in your hand and you're not distracted. There's no screen. There's no anything. There's no battery. <laughs> like you need light to read it. You just I don't know. You treat it in a different way. And uh, like me, when I read books, I tend to I like I like to go back in things and fold pages and. I, don't know, I just like the feel of physical books, so I like physical books. <laughs> and uh, do you know anything about the guy who invented these books? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I believe his name was Gutenberg. Um, I believe he had the, the first printing press, if you will, um, and sort of put all the scribes out of business. <laughs> um, other than like just sort of the generalities, don't know a lot of specifics about him, but I believe it was him that created the first printing press. Yeah, uh, because he made a lot of mistakes and uh, had a lot of failed companies before uh, mm. uh, before he invented the printing press and even when he uh, had his printing press company he uh, he was uh, r put out of business from some co-founders who had the money so he just um, it just took it or I don't know how to explain uh, if he finished uh, printing of the Bible uh, three months faster he had made a uh, 5,000 uh, whatever they had to this time, uh -huh. but since he couldn't pay back 800 at this moment, uh, he had, uh, yeah, his he was sued and lost um, his company. Yeah, but even with the, with a lot of these old school inventions, you sort of see that you have like the you know crazy inventor who invents it, and sometimes it's the same or different people who commercialize it. Even like with the telephone, you have Andrew, Andrew Allen, Andrew Alexander Graham Bell, um, who's the guy who like originally invented the thing, but it was almost like a whole different group, they were the ones that really took it and commercialized and got it all over the world. Um, so sometimes you see that. Yeah, and uh, who's the next uh, Gutenberg, in your opinion, who is the guy who uh, brings the, in the right internet product? Well, I know what you're going to say, Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> yeah, are you sure? I don't know, maybe it's someone else. Um, I don't know, well, it's an interesting question. I'd have to think about it for a little bit. I I'd probably even revert back to the... Um, I can't think of their names right now, but the the original founders of the internet. Burn, uh, Tim Berners-Lee? Yeah, Tim Berners-Lee, and um, there's one more guy too. I can't think of his name. But uh, yeah, whoever the original inventors of the internet were, because that that's literally, it's only because of the internet are we allowed to have these like different social structures and different sites and all this sort of stuff. So really that's like the underlying infrastructure that all of this continue. You know, the most famous examples of internet companies are, of course, like the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, of that in the world. But none of that would have been possible if the internet wasn't initially created. So I don't know. It depends how far back you want to look. But Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of people uh, at the moment and you can't uh, point to a single person. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> um, another question about these, uh, about the startup scene in general. Um, Every business model has to scale, or at the moment it's like a gold rush. Everyone tries to find these uh, these business models that scale. So mm -hmm. it's a special time we're living in because mm -hmm. I think in uh, I don't know five to ten years every business model that scales so fantastically, mm -hmm. like in the moment, will already be uh, done. 
Yeah, I mean, never before in the history of the world were you able to reach, you know, I don't know, above 100 million people, above a billion people. I mean, Facebook has a billion plus probably by now. Literally, you can build an app on top of Facebook that has the potential to reach all those people. Never before in anywhere in the history were so many people network together. I mean, you could even just look at all the mobile phone networks. I mean, there's, I don't even know, probably two, three billion people with mobile phones out there. So it's a crazy time. And, you know, we're measured by scale, not by hundreds of thousands of people anymore, but literally by hundreds of millions. Okay, and what's the, uh, what does um, scaling a company mean? Yeah, uh, scaling uh, in its simplest forms means uh, uh, growing a company over a large user base. So, you know, not having an, uh, a customer of one, but having a customer of 100 million people. So, in a lot of internet companies, you see scale used so well um, with uh, a lot of these uh, consumer internet companies. So, um, Twitter was interesting when it first started and had its like initial user base who really, really used it. But Twitter becomes really, really interesting when it has, I don't know how many people Twitter has now, whatever. Let's just say 500 million people using it. Because then you have like you have a huge platform for advertisers, you have a huge platform for data mining, you have a huge platform for all the, uh, 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 like their API feed and everything that goes on, data analytics, all the stuff. And it's really the scale and totality. So that sort of getting from a few hundred to a few thousands users to getting you know above like you know millions plus, that's what we refer to as scaling. And, and in Silicon Valley, there's a huge emphasis put on scaling. It's like hey, you're working on this thing and it works for the small audience, but how are you going to scale it? That's sort of what they talk about. Okay, and if it doesn't scale, no one cares. So a small bakery had, had any chance. Yeah, it's just um, nobody cares in the startup world. So like, um, and startup use very specifically towards like internet tech stuff. I mean, because uh, um, like in terms of like VCs or anything, VCs have to invest in companies that are going to like get really, really big. Like their LPs, their investors are expecting them to make a really high return. So even if they have, if they had a company A that guaranteed to make double its money, and company B that had a 1% chance of making a thousand times their money, VCs would always pick the latter one. Not saying this one, not saying this one's better than that one, but that's what VCs are interested in. And that's what a lot of the startup world is interested in. Um, so not saying not undervaluing this and not saying this isn't valuable, but just in terms of like the startup world, people put a lot of emphasis on scale. Um, and then it's just it's a different makeup of business. Like you might not ever be able to raise VC money, but you could probably make a lot of money for yourselves and like you know get a decent salary and all that stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. They're just two very different types of companies. And what's the easiest way to find a VC? Easiest way to find a VC? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, a lot of the VCs are located on Santa Road in Menlo Park, which is probably 10 minutes away from here, pretty close to Stanford. That's where they all sort of hang out and all sort of work. Um, so I should sit uh, in the street with a sign? <laughs> Maybe a cafe or something. <laughs> um, but in terms of like investment money, the easiest would either be traction, so if there is something out there that's getting a lot of users and attention and growth, um, or the other quick shortcut is have another VC invest in you. So if I can say, hey, uh, Andreas and Horowitz invested in me. Do you want to invest in me? That that's the quick, quickest, fastest, easiest way to get VC money. Um, kind of hard. You have to get the first one actually first. But either it's called social proof. So either social proof or traction. Those tend to be very easy. And um, do you think this gold rush at the moment is a bubble? Or? Yeah, interesting question. Um, when a lot of people refer to the bubble, they think of like 1999, and they think of all the you know um, all the internet dot coms back in the day. The, the big difference you have from today versus then is back then you had a lot of companies that were IPOing. You had, I don't even know, like you know a few thousand a year or something like that. I could be off on that number, but you had a large population of companies IPOing really quickly and a lot of public money. So a lot of non-institutional uh, investor money going into these companies and growing them all really quickly. The big difference you have now is like there's not a lot of companies going IPO. Facebook. Groupon, Zynga, Pandora, a few others. And by the time these companies go IPO, they're already at massive, massive scale. I mean, they all IPO'd for, I think, like a billion plus. So you're not seeing a lot of like the public money being locked into these things. You're seeing just the small subsection of venture capital and private equity money being locked up in these companies. So it's an interesting time. A lot of people are getting funded, but I wouldn't say it's the bubble in the traditional sense. If you were all to point at the bubble, you'd have to say it's in locked in the private equity world, but it's not really within the public world because we're not seeing a lot of companies go public anytime soon. 
there are a lot of companies that uh, will go bankrupt because of this new business model. So um, I don't know. Do you? Uh, how do people in Silicon Valley think about them? Is it just capitalism? Uh, yeah, it's like um, it's sort of it's a part of doing a startup. I mean, when a when VCs invest in companies, a general rule of thumb: if they invest in ten companies, they expect eight to fail, one to do sort of well, one to do really well, and one to do okay. So there's already the embedded expect expectation that most of the companies out there in the valley will fail um, within some some time frame, a couple years or anything like that. So failure is sort of regarded as like a different thing in Silicon Valley. It's not really a bad thing. Um, in fact, like um, a lot of VCs will say the first thing they look for before investing in you is they want to see you fail somewhere else. That's actually a positive thing, not a, not a negative thing. They're like, oh hey, he's tried something and he's failed. He must have learned a whole lot. Maybe this one will be his success. So we have this like strange view on failure, and failure is not technically a bad thing here. It's sometimes more of a good thing than not. Okay, um, <laughs> if if someone wants to start a, a startup digest in his city, what or what person should apply, and how should they do it? Yeah, for those cities and for for any city, startup digest is isn't in. The best thing to go to is uh, startupdigest.com/curator. You can find that page on the front page, right in the navigation bar. Just reach out to us and let us know. Um, just a short little application form, and then we'll reach back out to you and see if it makes sense to do a startup digest in your city. Okay, great. I don't have any more questions. Do you have a question you wanted always to answer? Uh. What uh, do you uh, will you sell your company if you're if you're fucking rich or uh, <laughs> is it a life and hard project? Yeah, um, I mean it's always it, it's a definite possibility. I mean, uh, um, uh, you sort of learn by being an entrepreneur that you, you don't say no to a lot of things. <laughs> you sort of look for options and see what's out there. So you know, if somebody was out there that made sense that you know liked us uh, philosophically and we sort of got along with, sure, we'd be open to it. Um, not saying we're doing anything any time particular uh, uh, now, but <laughs> oh, not close to it by any means. Okay, I have uh, one more question. What's um, what's the most interesting startup at the moment? I hate this question. It's interesting. So like, like the the um, the the sort of the large companies that you see come out, like you know. Pinterest before they got really popular, Core before they became popular, they tend to be um, uh, very undiscovered, undiscovered. They tend to be small. They don't look that interesting, or like they're only for a small niche, or you know they're not that pretty. So uh, a lot of people have this perception of like you know Facebook now they're so huge when they started they must have been like you know um, crazy and beautiful and everything and they just must have taken it off like instantly and all that. But when it first started, it was literally like a You know, it was a small little network for Harvard, and even before that, there was this thing called Face Mash. So it was just basically like a hot or not for like girls within Harvard. So when you first look at the thing, it doesn't really look like much. It doesn't. Um, it's not that impressive. It's only after the fact that that becomes really interesting. So it's really, really, really hard to to look at a company and say, I think this one's going to be successful. I mean, literally, this is what investors do day in and day out with their money, and most of them don't get it right. Um, VCs as an investment class produces negative returns. They don't make any money as a, as a whole in totality. There's some VC funds that do really good, but as a whole, the VC industry is not very good at picking companies. So as somebody who doesn't even do this professionally, it's terribly hard for me to look at a company and say, this one's going to be really, really interesting. Um, that being said, there is this one um, uh, there's this one app that I just downloaded recently called WeChat, it's actually a Chinese company. I don't know what the, the, the Chinese company's name is though, but it's sort of like a, um, uh, it's sort of like a chat client where you could also like do videos and you can do like a, a voice and text and all that. It's kind of interesting. It's really, really popular within China. I think they first just started coming over here. Um, it's sort of equivalent to WhatsApp if you sort of, sort of know what that is. Um, but I think it's like it has a, a couple things which are more interesting. That being said, that's literally just the most recent one that I downloaded yesterday that I thought was interesting. But for me to project that I think that one's going to be really, really popular, hard for me to say. But that's my answer. <laughs> no, I just um, my my question was more about uh, what company is the most fun to work with. So what oh, does your uh, where where does uh, every one of your um, VIP wants to be? 
Oh, which one's the most is fun? Is it now? still Facebook or uh, is there already the next? Um, there's one that's doing pretty interesting and pretty well right now, Stripe. So they're sort of a, a um, payments company. Not that sexy, not that interesting, but the team is pretty kick ass. Um, or uh, um, GitHub. Uh, so a lot of engineers use GitHub, it's a version control system. Uh, started uh, out in San Francisco. They're doing pretty interesting things. Um, so, but I don't know, a lot of it depends on like, it, it's more not what's hot and what everybody's enjoying, it's more like what you're interested in. We sort of found that like, uh, uh, what the person's passionate about, what they're most excited about, what they're most interested in, tends to be more important than like what's the hottest company out there. So we, that's why we try and individually tailor sort of the VIP product to each person that comes in, as opposed to saying, hey, this is the best company that everybody should join. But those are two examples of like pretty interesting companies around here. Okay, thank you. That's it, we can leave the pool. Okay. <laughs> Let's get him <in> the water. <laughs>